everybody. Good morning if you're in the Eastern Coast, as I am today. Uh, I'm very honored to be here hosting this event uh, with incredible speakers. My name is Carolina Rossini, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Portulans Institute, a nonprofit think tank based in the sea and with collaborators in Geneva and Toronto. We are a young organization founded at the end of 2019, and our mission includes informing stakeholders by producing independent, rigorous metric and database research. You can learn more at portulandinstitutes.org. Today, it's an honor to host this event in cooperation with UNESCO. Our two-hour event program is divided in two segments. The first one is focused on the importance of digital transformation to rebuild more inclusive, diverse, and equitable economies in the post-COVID world. And during the second segment, we will launch the 2020 Network Readiness Index. At the moment, at that moment, my colleague Bruno Lanvin from INSEAD and also a co-founder of Portulans will present the NRI results for 2020. We are thankful uh, to STL who um, have joined us this year as the NRI knowledge partner. So some quick housekeeping details. We will have opportunity for a Q&A uh, in both uh, event segments, and I encourage you to send your questions in the chat. I will, during the Q&A, pose your questions to the speakers. So please, I encourage you to identify yourself and the speaker you are addressing your question to. Second, we encourage you to share your thoughts and comments online to enrich our virtual conversation about digital transformation. So you can follow Portulans in various social medias, including LinkedIn, Twitter at Portulans I, um, and also Instagram at Portulans. During all of our events, we will be live in tweeting, we will be live tweeting under the hashtag NRI2020. So let's start. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, to you our speakers today in alphabetical order. We have Dr. Anand Argaral, who is the group CEO of STL and is a passionate about driving technological advancement to impact everyday life. He, is, he was named recently the CEO of the year, the year at the Economic Telecom Digital Summit for his significant contribution to the Indian telecom ecosystem. Professor Sumitra Dutta uh, is a professor of management and the former founding dean of the Cornell S.C. Johnson College of Business. He's an authority on technology and innovation, and he's the co-editor of the Global Innovation Index with WIPO, and also the Network Readiness Index uh, published by Portulans. Uh, Dr. Demi Gesco, he's a friend and mentor, and he's the chairman person of the Brazilian Network In Information Center Executive Board. He uh, is part of the Internet Hall of Fame, and he has played a, a he, uh, he was a key player on actually establishing the first internet connection in Brazil. So I'm very uh, thankful to him since I'm originally from Brazil. Uh, Ms. Dorothy Gordon, who is the chair of the UNESCO Information for All program and board member of the UNESCO Institute for Information Technology, uh, sorry, uh, UNESCO Institute for Information Technologies in Education. She has over two decades of leadership in the field, having working mainly in Af Africa and Asia. And um, last but not least, uh, Ms. Sasha Rubel, who is the program specialist in the digital innovation and transformation section of the communication and information sector at UNESCO. In this framework, she coordinates the organization work on artificial intelligence, digital transformation, and internet governance. And I want to say I'm very thankful to you, Sasha, for all your collaboration in putting this event and the uh, upcoming uh, regional spotlights together. So thank you so much. In the second segment of our event today, we will have the honor to be joined by uh, uh, Your Excellency Minister Anders Yagman, who since 2019 has served as the Minister for Energy and Digital Development for Sweden. Okay. So let's start. I ask you please to keep your comments to four minutes um, so we keep a, 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 a dynamic dialogue. So uh, Sumitra, uh, I would like to uh, pass the word to you. Uh, in your view, uh, how 
can countries leverage innovation and network readiness to strive for competitiveness in this, in, in hopefully a post-COVID world? Yeah, thank you, Carolina, for inviting us and also for hosting this uh, panel. Uh, I wanted to piggyback and thank uh, some of our panel members have spoken already and piggyback on their comments and really reflect on how the views of countries vis-a-vis -vis technology has changed over the last two decades. Uh, my colleague, uh, Bruno Lanva, will talk about the Network Readiness Index results for this year, but he and I were part of the original team that helped create the Network Readiness Index at the World Economic Forum in 2001, 2002 time period. And reflecting back almost 20 years ago, uh, the focus really was on all the positive things technology would bring. You know, the, the world was so rosy and so bright and everyone thought the technology would change you know, the world in all the positive ways, would make information available for everyone. Uh, it would in fact help democracy to thrive because people would have better information. It would make our lives easier in so many ways and so on. And we designed the Network Readiness Index back in 2002 to really reflect what we thought were pretty advanced thinking around technology in those days. So those days, the NRI model was very much focused on trying to look at placing technology in the midst of society, in the midst of the various actors, the businesses, the governments, individuals. And we were probably the first ones to talk around, talk about issues like the impact of political stability, the impact of regulation, the impact of the government on technology. Those days, two, two decades ago, the view of technology was very much around bits and bytes and more hardware, software and communication, hardware and so on. Now, over the two decades, clearly technology has helped countries compete in many ways, helped improve our lives in many ways, helped societies uh, develop in many ways. And I don't have to give examples of that to our audience because the audience all know of many examples. We use technology in our daily lives in ways in which was inconceivable two decades ago. Even countries like Korea, Israel, you know, Finland, and more recently China and India, they have in fact uh, become competitive by using technology as a key element of the national strategy. So in many ways, technology has helped countries become more competitive and we see this trend continuing as technology keeps on evolving. And today, as you know, in the US and China, uh, for example, there's a race towards seeing which country will get there at the technology frontier of AI, because both countries and many other countries in the world realize that being there at the technology frontier is very important for competitiveness and leadership. Now, at the same time, if you reflect on what Dorothy said earlier, uh, issues around trust, issues around inclusion, issues around security, issues around you know, all these concerns have emerged on the table front and center in the last, I would say, five, seven, eight years. And not that the issues were fundamentally new, they've been sort of simmering below the surface uh, in many ways, but now what has happened in the last five, seven years is that these issues have become center stage. And today, when you go to many technology events or conferences, mm -hmm. Of course, technology will has, has had and will continue to have a positive impact on our lives, but much more discussion is focused on how will we ensure technology inclusive? How will we ensure that the right level of trust is engendered? How will we ensure that uh, we are able to build a safe and secure environment for our democracies and our governments to function? And these kind of concerns really has sort of shifted the pendulum in technology discussions from what I would argue to from hope to fear. A fear about how technology is perhaps changing the world around us in ways in which it not fully anticipate or in ways in which not fully able to control necessarily. So I really think today the discussion on technology and competitiveness of course lies at the heart of both productivity debates and competitiveness industries and wealth creation, but also I think lies at the heart of building trustworthy, trusting society, looking up the well-being of people 
and being more inclusive in our approaches. And this is where I think, you know, uh, both uh, Demi and Anand talked about the impact of measurement becomes very critical. And this is where I hope this net network readiness index effort really tries to raise the level of discussion and raise the level of awareness of policymakers to these key issues. And that's one reason why when my colleague Dr. Bruno Landwehr will describe the model, we have revised the model two years ago and it includes many of these aspects, which I think are very important for the future of, uh, of technology usage effectively in our societies and our countries. Thank you. Thank you, Sumitra, so much. Um, Demi, if I can come back to you, uh, I think uh, Sumitra touched a little bit on the role of governments on this and how we try through the indexes really uh, measure a lot of the governance space, right? So I, I personally call it uh, the input um, uh, measurements, right? That have the output, the benefits. So in your opinion, Demi, how can government support the idea of building forward better? Um, in a post-COVID world? And what is the role of, of governance and technology uh, in, this, in this sense? Oh, thank you for the question, Carolina. It's not an easy answer for this question, but anyway, I will try to, to put some, at least some Brazilian data on that. Uh, first of all, it's, it's clear that we, we all become more digital today, like uh, Nicolas Negroponte said 20 years ago, being digital. Uh, the, the pandemic uh, underscored the importance of digital technologies uh, for the survival of enterprises, uh, education, commerce, all of us, uh, for our living, for working, studying activities, and so. Then uh, uh, we have this mix, uh, 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 mixed issues because, of course, we have a lot of problems because of pandemic, but also the, the digital technologies help us uh, to go through COVID, showing health measures, uh, uh, transmitting uh, uh, information to the society, and is a powerful tool against the pandemic that the digital uh, systems offers to us. Then, uh, uh, beginning to, to examine some, some cases. For example, in Brazil, we have, after the outbreak of, of coronavirus, we have uh, a peak of, of traffic, uh, as I said, uh, 13.5 terabits per second of, of, of exchange of traffic. But we also have, uh, for example, the, the closing of the schools. Then what happened to the children and adolescent, adolescents as the schools went to a full closure? This is a, it's a very difficult uh, issue to tackle. We have uh, around uh, uh, 5 million children and adolescents uh, living in, uh, in homes without internet access, according to our last uh, survey in ICT uh, household and in kids, kids online survey also. Then the question is, uh, 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 what about the rights of, of these children to having access of quality and ed equitable education? Uh, disconnected uh, households and indiv individuals without the proper uh, digital skills represents a big challenge, uh, no, uh, not only to the government, but also to the, all the families here in Brazil. So, so uh, the dynamic of this process of, of, of of the pandemic probably will change uh, not only the, the, the gover governance uh, methods, but also the mindset of the individuals. We will not be the same uh, after this, this pandemic and the digital technologies will be even proven more important in that context. Uh, 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 another aspect important is that the, 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 this pandemic revealed the, the, how fragile we are in the context of socioeconomic disparities in our countries. And uh, when it comes to the digital, to the internet broadband co connectivity. Human rights also uh, has been exercised online uh, mo more and more. So having access to the internet has become essential for, for all of us and uh, uh, the network turns even more important for continuity of our daily lives. The clear message to the governments, ICT industry, and internet providers uh, should be, they, they have to join efforts to engage in effective dialogue in how digital transformation and COVID should lead to a multi-stakeholder approach so we can build forward a better post-COVID world. Uh, I, I can uh, point to at, at least two uh, uh, goals to building forward better. Uh, we have two big challenges to address. One is, of course, the infrastructure gap. Uh, 
uh, providing equitable access to digital technology networks to all of us. And the other, but not less important, is we have to develop digital literacy and, 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 and break the skill uh, gap we have aiming to develop instrumental use of ICTs. It is not just to access uh, popular platforms. It's not enough uh, to, to have access to social media. We have to uh, go to the appropriation level of ICTs and government will have to address the existing digital skill gap and ensures that all can really be engaged in the digital uh, world realm. In concluding, uh, I, I just want to comment that we last year saw a big achievement uh, when UN stated the declaration of digital interdependence. And my closing words in this uh, question were extracted from that document. It says, we are in the foothills of the digital age and the cooperation in the digital space is paramount as individuals, institutions, corporations, and government cannot manage digital developments alone. And that the global aspiration of vulnerabilities are deeply interconnected and interdependent. Thank you. Yes, that's, that's wonderful, Demi. And um, uh, I think the digital cooperation effort at the UN level with multi-stakeholder engagement is extremely relevant nowadays. So we get this right. Um, and I know there are a lot of efforts to ensure that that digital cooperation also comes with issue of trust, ethics, cybersecurity, and so forth. Dorothy, just a follow-up question to you. Um, so what is the role of uh, education uh, to ensure that digital transformation is um, accessible and benefits all? When, when you say education, um, are you talking about information literacy, digital literacy, or you're talking about education sector? I'm assuming it's the first one. Um, this is an area that is surprising that we haven't been very systematic about up to now. Uh, looking at it globally, I find that um, there may be part of it being done by citizenship education, part of it being done by adult education, part of it being done by various government bodies involved in this, but no coordination between them, no agreement on really what should be covered and no tools to measure the impact of what has been done in this area. And so um, with the kind of focus we've had on fake news and disinformation during COVID, um, and I think COVID is always going to be with us. It's a virus, it will not go away. It will manifest in different ways. Um, but uh, it's really emphasized that we need to become far more systematic about this. We need to be clear and we need to design the messaging in a different way for different groups. So while we need to make sure that our children are safe online and that our educational system addresses this, in the spirit of the SDG4 and lifelong learning, we have to make sure that at any point in somebody's lifetime, they can get the information they need on how to manage their technology life. You know, and I am always surprised that so many people give away data without thinking and discussing this. Somebody said, okay, we can call them simple users. They just want to use it and they just want it to work. They don't want to think about the data implications of this. And I think we have to force people to understand, uh, force not in an aggressive way, but make sure that the messaging is consistent and it is constant. And I also just want to say um, how much I appreciated the way these issues were addressed in the Secretary General's Roadmap for Digital Cooperation. It's really very important. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Yes, I, I, I have the same sentiment as you. I see digital literacy efforts since the early 90s. And uh, sometimes it feels that we are reinventing the wheel. So hopefully under the digital corporation work, uh, those efforts will really, really bring together uh, for better impact. So um, Anand, 
I think one of the things we haven't discussed so far is actually the specific role of the private sector in all of this. Uh, we, uh, uh, Dorothy and Demi and Sumitra, they all address the issue of the, the responsibility and in some cases even the liability of the private sector um, from content moderation issues with disinformation to uh, setting the supporting governments and societies and communities in setting the infrastructure. Could you, could you let us know a little bit coming from the private sector, uh, what do you see the role and, and responsibility? Thank you. Sure. Uh, I, I, see the, I see the role of the private sector is towards uh, uh, enablement of the transformation that digital is going to, is providing us. Uh, I mean, uh, any of the examples that we ca uh, can take currently, uh, just take the example of uh, what we were discussing, whether it's education and healthcare. Uh, healthcare. Uh, in terms of uh, creating the right content, uh, in terms of making sure that the right delivery of that is happening, uh, and uh, and creating access for all, and there would be there would be uh, kind of challenges there in in creating uh, the the content and making sure that there is ubiquitous delivery. But it is the first time. See, we are reaching a critical mass for people having access towards uh, utilitarian needs on the digital platform for the first time. And that's why when we are discussing these kind of questions about trust, about data privacy, about the fact what uh, Demi talked about, that what about the rights of the 5 million adolescents in Brazil? We are, we are discussing education delivery as a right over a digital platform. And that's where uh, the, the private sector starts coming in. It's not only about uh, developing technology, it's about ensuring that that technology creates that uh, transformation for which it is, uh, uh, for which it is, uh, 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 it's developed and doing it in an uh, equitable manner uh, and doing it with uh, the kind of uh, uh, digital interdependence that uh, uh, UN is talking about and doing it in cooperation with uh, the government as a, uh, as a regulator or as a partner. So I would say uh, the transformation that uh, digital is supposed to deliver, uh, the applications, uh, the application and the uh, creating these uh, nice application for all the things that we spoke about is the accountability of the private sector. Creating the technologies for on which the platform will deliver in uh, the, the kind of uh, engagement that we are having right now, uh, uh, an online high-speed engagement, which we have uh, almost gotten, uh, taken it for granted. Uh, that's the responsibility of the private sector. And then making sure that in some kind of uh, uh, combination with the government, with this interdependence, creating the right infrastructure, making sure that the unconnected get connected will be a, a, a co-dependent uh, project. And it's, uh, that's where the role of uh, technology comes in. Uh, the, most of the investments that are happening uh, with, with, with venture capital, with, uh, within the uh, organizations that are developing. Uh, and uh, we, we got to do this in an extremely collaborative manner uh, because, because of the fact that it is an all encompassing uh, transformation which is going to happen. And digital is not going to be an industry or a sector for which you can kind of uh, uh, think of it different from others. So mm -hmm. I, I see this as a as, as something in terms of application delivery, in terms of platform management, in terms of technology investments, and in terms of the networks. Everywhere the role of the private sector is going to be there. It's going to be in different orders. It's going to be in different needs. We got to be uh, very, very cognizant of all the factors that everyone spoke about but notwithstanding all, the, the enablement of digital will happen only when private sector truly starts playing its role uh, 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 in, in, in the delivery. Thank you, Anand, thank you. And um, one very interesting thing is that we developed this dialogue on digital transformation in advance of the panels. Um, and we interview various folks from the private sector, public sector, international organizations. Um, so is that the 
portulansinstitute.org website. And uh, another thing that uh, I heard from private sector uh, um, CEOs and representatives is that digital transformation also has allowed for more job creations in terms of because you allow for remote work. Right now you can access and bring talent and train talent from around the world. And that was a very optimistic and hopeful view in a moment that we are seeing such an economic crisis in so many sectors. But I don't want to delay, um, and I want to pass uh, the word to Sasha Arubel. For those who have joined more recently, I just want to reintroduce Sasha. She's the program specialist in digital innovation and transformation section of the communication and information sector at UNESCO. Uh, in this framework, she coordinates the organization uh, work on artificial intelligence, digital transformation, and internet governance. Uh, she has been an incredible partner in putting this event together and the upcoming regional spotlight events. So I want to just thank you again, Sasha. And my question to you, you have the big responsibility of, of really linking everything that everybody said. Um, uh, and and what, what is needed to ensure that no one is left behind if you take into consideration all that was commented so far and all can harness the benefits of this digital transformation? So thank you very much, Carolina, and uh, thank you so much to Demi, Dorothy, Sumitra, and Anand uh, uh, for your insight and input. And, and really, uh, would just like to underline the uh, pleasure of UNESCO in cooperating with Portulans and, and you, Carolina, and the extraordinary work you've done in coordinating this global conversation, but also the regional conversations that we'll see participation from our regional directors on the ground. This is actually my, my favorite position possible with, is, uh, is going last in order to synthesize some of the uh, great jewels of insight and knowledge that have come from all the stakeholders around the table. And I'm uh, very happy to see that uh, the priorities for UNESCO are very much in line with what was reflected uh, from the private sector, from civil society, and from the technical community around the table. So from the perspective of UNESCO, there are really five overarching needs as it concerns ensuring that no one is left behind and that the benefits of digital transformation are harnessed by all. Uh, the first is building an inclusive digital economy and society. The second is developing human and institutional capacity. The third is protecting human rights and human agency. The fourth, and it's come up a lot in conversations over the past hour, is promoting digital trust, security, and stability. And the last aspect, which builds on what Demi was saying as it concerns digital interdependence, is making sure that there are platforms to promote global digital cooperation. So I'd just like to, reflecting on uh, what the different panelists have said, break down these five areas of priority for UNESCO. So the first one, building an inclusive digital economy and society. At UNESCO, we see investing in diversity, including notably voices from the global south and marginalized groups, including indigenous communities, disabled communities, but also largely women and youth as absolutely essential. And what we have uh, also evoked uh, over the past hour together is the need for data to drive these kinds of decisions in public policy making. So I'm going to give you some data that underlines why for us this is absolutely crucial. The OECD estimates that just 7% of ICT patents in G20 countries are obtained by women, and only 10% of technology startup companies seeking venture capital funding were founded by women. Wired Magazine reviewed AI research pages of leading technology companies and found that only between 10 and 15% of researchers were women. Google's AI pages listed 641 people working on machine intelligence, but only around 60 of them are women. Currently, fewer than 1% of the applications uh, that are received as it concerns hiring experts for AI and data science jobs are coming from women, fewer than 1%. So these kinds of data points underlines for UNESCO that who codes matters, how we code matters, and why we code matters. And in order to address these aspects, what we see at UNESCO in order to ensure that no one is left behind is the need to identify existing bias uh, in digital technologies such as facial recognition. And this has been making the front pages for a while now with the Black Lives Matter movement. We need to curate inclusively by ensuring diversity, not only in the data sets themselves, but also in the digital workforce. And we need to develop conscientiously by making sure that there are ethical standards and training in the ethics of digital technology available to different stakeholder groups. 
This also leads me to what uh, Demi Getschko was talking about in terms of diversity inclusion is that we need to invest in multi-stakeholder approaches to digital governance. And there are examples that are coming out of, for example, Brazil uh, and Demi underlined the great work of Nick.br and Net Mundial that should be emulated so that everybody has a seat at the table in the development, design and deployment of public policies and programs related to digital transformation so that we can build forward better. The second aspect is looking at developing human and institutional capacity. And this has come up quite a bit in what uh, several panelists have underlined as absolutely crucial. At UNESCO, we understand that democracy is not just about voting for your leaders, but also premised on the idea that ordinary citizens understand the issues at heart. So if we need democratic debate about what kind of digital future we want, we need to make sure that we have and we are investing in digital literacy. So this means digital literacy of citizens and youth and marginalized groups groups, but again, also decision makers, and this uh, points to the fact that has been discussed on multiple occasions in this panel, that in fact, the question of digital transformation is no longer a question just for the Ministry of ICT, but is actually transversal. So it points to the need to build institutional capacities in understanding the issues at hand, but also in ensuring that we do not work in silos between ministries, uh, between different government sectors, but also between stakeholder groups. Here again, because gender equality has come up, I would like to underline the but it's particularly important that we invest in digital literacy for women. Uh, today, women and girls are 25% less likely than men to know how to leverage digital technology for basic purposes. They are four times less likely to know how to program computers and 13 times less likely to file for a technology patent. So if we are talking about a diverse and inclusive digital future, we need to make sure that everybody is equipped with the necessary skills and have a seat, has a seat at the table. This links also to what Dorothy was talking about as it concerns the need to invest in research. We need data-driven public policy practices, but we also need to avoid the brain drain of uh, experts in digital issues leaving their countries and investing in places like uh, big companies from the United States and Europe and China. So we need to support PhD programs. We need to invest in training the future researchers on issues of digital transformation related to areas that are otherwise, unfortunately, often overlooked, including gender bias, cultural diversity, peace, environmental sustainability, and other issues. We also need to understand in this regard and need more researchers that look at the link between digital transformation and open data. This is something that is absolutely essential to UNESCO's work, where we are promoting uh, the link, for example, between global data commons and AI commons and open access to scientific information, which is at the heart of our work. This links thirdly to what we were talking about as it concerns investing in the local startup economies, like what Dorothy said. We need to focus on designing and developing AI solutions which respond, re reflecting on what Anand also said with the global and local approach, to localized problems in less wealthy nations and regions. We do not need to be promoting transferring from technology intensive nations. We need to be training and investing in the startup ecosystem so that there are developments that are based on deep understandings of respective regions and culture. We also need to invest in the development of institutional capaci capacities in participatory public policy development. And this is something that UNESCO is doing very concretely through, for example, our AI decision makers toolkit, which includes, as Dorothy underlined, the need to think about foresight. What are the issues that will be on the table on di of digital transformation that we're not yet talking about, that we need to raise awareness of and be prepared both in terms of standard setting, but also of public policies and programs so that we can harness a human-centered and human rights-based digital transformation, which leads me to the third aspect. We need to protect human rights and human agency. And UNESCO's Internet Universality Framework, which was adopted by 195 member states in 2015, advocates for a framework of digital governance that is based on human rights, that is open, that is accessible, and that is multi-stakeholder. And our official position of the UN at large is that human rights that exist offline exist in the same way in the online environment. And this is absolutely essential. 
Fourthly, we need to promote digital trust, security, and stability. And this is something that has come up on multiple occasions by many panelists throughout this conversation. And one of the ways that we are working at UNESCO to promote this trust is by developing standard setting in the field of digital ethics. Specifically right now, UNESCO is working on the development of the first global standard setting instrument in the fields of the ethics of artificial intelligence that will guide a human rights-based development, deployment, and design of artificial intelligence throughout the entire life cycle. So to have trust, we need to develop multi-stakeholder shaped standards that can be adopted in public policies, but also in programs at the global and local level. And then lastly, we need to foster digital cooperation. And we do that first and foremost by promoting meaningful connection. And I really appreciate how many of the panelists today have underlined that we need meaningful connection, that it is not just about having access and infrastructure. And meaningful connections means that we need to identify and connect communities of intent in problem solving with digital solutions. We need to contribute to best practices and knowledge of problem solving with digital solutions to, that advocate for sustainable development. We need to build. So what does this mean? We need to promote and make available shared resources through open access frameworks and collaborations that build digital solutions that are beneficial and solve real world local problems. And then lastly, we need to work together in this framework of digital cooperation to scale. We need to engage synergies and collaborations for impact and help bring existing solutions to support global needs and scale solutions that benefit all. So one of the things that I hear from all of the panelists and which is also reflected in uh, the Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation that was launched in June of this past year is a kind of a, a four pronged approach. So we need to connect meaningful. We need to protect human rights. We need to respect communities by investing in diversity and inclusion, but we also, here's the fourth aspect that I will close on, need to remedy. And this is where the question of measurement plays an important role. And Demi, I loved, as always, what you said, where you said uh, and underlined, we can't change what we can't measure. And this is where remedying and measurement comes in. We need to develop a globally accepted methodology for ethical impact assessments of digital technologies that includes guidance for its implementation in all stages of the digital life cycle based on rigorous scientific research. And in this regard, we need, which is similar to what the NRI has as a fundamental ambition and why we are happy to be here today to be reflecting on this, is we need to develop a readiness methodology that helps countries identify their status at specific moments of their readiness trajectory along a continuum of dimensions related to the digital sector. We also need to develop this globally accepted methodology to evaluate the effectiveness and efficiency of the policies for digital transformation that are adopted and implemented based on this readiness index. And we need to strengthen research and evidence-based analysis and reporting on policies regarding digital transformation, including through comparative indexes. This will allow us to collect and disseminate successfully progress, innovations, research reports, scientific publications, data and statistics regarding policies for digital transformation to support the sharing of best practices and mutual learning, but also to ensure beyond the public sector that tools such as ethical impact assessments or algorithmic audits are deployed by different stakeholder groups. So we have this diverse and inclusive and human centered digital transformation and innovation for all. On this side, I'd like to close by citing uh, Alan Turing, uh, who invented uh, artificial intelligence uh, to defeat uh, one of the biggest wars that we've fought since COVID-19, which is World War II, where he underlined that we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. So we'd just like to thank all the panelists for this reflection on digital transformation as outlined in the UN Secretary General's roadmap and also the report on digital interdependence. Indeed, there is plenty there that needs to be done, but we are confident that through this kind of digital cooperation with different stakeholder groups, including those who are here today, we can harness digital transformation to reduce human suffering and not to increase it through widening the gap of the digital divide. Thank you very much, Carolina.